So my name's Ben Biebenroth. I am the chef and founder of Spice Hospitality Group. I have been doing uh, this craft for a little over 20 years now. I started as a dishwasher in this business, actually. And I, one day I got put on the cook line because someone didn't show up for work. And I fell in love with the speed and the culture of the kitchen before I fell in love with cuisine. I grew up in Strongsville. My dad was a health teacher. My mom was a business and accounting teacher. They both taught at Parma City Schools. So I was always a healthy eater. I was always cooking a lot with my mom. And it wasn't until that moment when I got thrown online at a Rockneys in Kent, actually, while my wife was going to college. And I just fell in love with the business, like the pace of it. Everybody had tattoos. They were telling dirty jokes. I was like, yes, this is it. And I'm an ADHD kid, so I was not built for the classroom. But I realized once I got out of school that I actually kind of had superpowers in the kitchen because I could multitask really well. Um, I could move really fast. I could take a lot of abuse. And, um, and, and turns out that's what makes a great chef. So uh, I really enjoyed uh, my rise through the ranks in multiple different kitchens. Um, but it was sort of happenstance that I, in, that I found myself in this industry. Um, so I started Spice Kitchen and Bar, or Spice Catering Company rather, um, officially after I got out of the Marine Corps. And I was catering on the side. And then I went to Johnson & Wales in Charleston, South Carolina in 2003. And I graduated with honors and I won a cooking competition to go to Australia with a French master chef for two and a half months and cooked all around the country. And it was like, I had this moment um, with Jean-Jacques Dietrich. He was retiring as an instructor at Johnson & Wales. I was just graduating. And we were sitting in this dry creek bed together eating a kangaroo tail out of a campfire with these Aboriginal women. Um, and I had this like revelation of like, man, if there's this much food to eat, in the desert in the middle of Australia. Just imagine how much food there is in the forests in the Ohio River Valley. And that was when my wife and I decided like, we're moving back home and we are gonna make an impact in this region um, with culinary arts. So we did that. Um, my grandparents uh, passed away and we bought their house and we built the catering kitchen in their basement, a little 800 square foot bungalow in Parma. And my chef, who was my roommate in culinary school, moved up to Cleveland and lived in our attic. And we literally turned the garage into the warehouse and we ran that business for a year. And then I partnered up with Marigold um, Catering Company. And so they were like my box lunch default and I was like their organic upsell. And it really worked out. So I grew the business up to about a half million dollars over the course of four years. And then that was when I moved over to um, Gordon Square Arts District and I had Spice Kitchen and Bar. We opened New Year's Eve of 2012 and then promptly closed for two weeks of training after that because it was very rough. I was taking a lot of lumps, I would say, blind with ambition. And after running Spice Kitchen for about a year, we were starting to kind of turn some heads as far as utilizing a lot of local seasonal produce, which we will be using here today, some butternut squash from Rainbow Farms. Uh, and then I got an opportunity to um, bid on a lease on a farm in the Cuyahoga Valley National Park in 2013. And we purchased that lease from Spring Hill Farm and moved there and formed Spice Acres. So I moved my whole family there. I was growing a ton of produce at my home in Broadview Heights at the time. Um, the city was always on me about having to cut the front lawn, um, which was actually 3,000 heads of garlic. So I will not cut that. Um, but it was, it, I was like at a point of contention with the community and the compost pile had taken over the driveway and my wife was kind of like at max capacity. So we moved our kids and uh, over to the farm in the Cuyahoga Valley and that's when we started Spice Acres. And through doing that, we had a school come out and offer to volunteer on the farm as we were getting set up. And the whole place was about eight feet tall with weeds and piles of manure and you name it. Uh, the farmer that was there before us had let it go fallow for two years. He had two shoulder surgeries and so wasn't able to farm anymore. Um, so the school volunteered to come out for five days in a row, every five weeks, all day long. It was South Suburban Montessori School in Brecksville. One of the first things we did was we were mucking out this barn stall of all this lamb manure and loading it onto this trailer. 
and I told the kids, it was like, okay, we're gonna plant garlic today, and we don't wanna waste this manure because it's really nutrient-dense stuff, so we're gonna plant six cloves every six inches. We're gonna take a pound of this garlic and count how many cloves are in a pound. Then we're gonna weigh all this garlic and you're gonna tell me how long the row needs to be and then that's how long we're gonna spread the manure over. And the teacher looked at me and she was like, uh, we're not doing this yet. <laughs> and I was like, well, we're doing it today because we have to plant garlic. So that was like this breakthrough moment. I was like, oh my gosh, we have a STEM program on our hands. So we started um, Spice Field Kitchen, which is our nonprofit. Uh, there's some cards out there. We have a high goal of $30,000 to raise before the end of the year for our operations. We are currently in 29 schools. We manage gardens outside of six different schools in five different school districts. And we just crossed the threshold of educating 7,200 kids this year over the span of the last five or six years since we officially formed the organization. Uh, so what we do is we teach kids the importance of healthy eating and healthy soil. And we look at that as the cornerstones of having a healthy community. So you cannot correct the health of a community until you address what people are eating and where they're getting that food from. A lot of people say like, oh, food is medicine. And I argue against that all the time. Food is absolutely not medicine. This is food. And if you sit it right here on this counter and wait for it to cure someone of an ailment, it will never do that. So choice is actually medicine. And in order to make a better choice, you need to be educated, you need to have access to the ingredients, and you need to have the confidence and the wherewithal to actually do that. So we look at that and working with kids in environments where they may not have access to fresh food, they may not have cutting boards, even like this, and knives and toaster ovens. Um, it's a tall order to encourage kids from a marginalized community to eat healthier when number one, they don't see anybody else eating like that, Number two, they don't know where to get that stuff. And number three, they don't know how to do it. So now that we're entering into this like fifth year of operations, we're actually seeing kids that wouldn't eat anything green in their first year to now craving kale and Brussels sprouts and rutabaga because they have been put in touch with these products in the ground. And we, we take away those aversions and we just make it fun, you know? This is really my life's calling. Um, I'm determined to change how people interact with the earth. I do that with food, and uh, Spice Field Kitchen gives me the vessel to do that. Not exactly Boom's Pizza, but it's pretty cool. So we're gonna do some different stuff today. Uh, somebody out there said, oh, he's making pizza. I am absolutely not making pizza. I could never do that. We're, we're opening Boom's Pizza Lakewood right next door to Matt's uh, first location of Melt, Matt Fish. Um, we felt like this was a really strong community to open this business in. We bake in a very high temperature oven, about 580 degrees, for about six and a half, seven minutes, and puts off an absolutely magical pie. So, one size, 14 inch pizzas, absolutely awesome. Three salads, three appetizers, Klondike bars, cold beer. It's gonna be great, you're gonna love it. But, today, I am making a totally different dish that you cannot get at Boom's Pizza. And you could probably get it if you had us come out and cater, um, which Spice Catering Company is still alive and well, even though my restaurant, Spice Kitchen, has found a better home. This recipe that I'm making today is a butternut squash mac and cheese. I cater for the Cleveland Cavs. Um, they absolutely love this recipe. I make it with gluten-free pasta for them. Those guys are, for the most part, dairy-free, gluten-free. They're trying to eliminate as many um, inflammatory responses as possible. So this recipe fits really well into that. It has some dairy in it with the cheese, um, but not super heavy with a lot of heavy cream and things like that. The way I do this is we take some squash first and foremost. I took a butternut squash, cut it in half, put this, pulled the seeds out of it, and then just peeled it and diced it. So somebody was telling me, oh, I can never peel a butternut squash well. My secret for that is wherever you cut it, start at that end with the peeler and get the edge of the peeler underneath that skin first and then you can get a full nice strip and it's really really simple to clean that squash up like that so you can roast it you can roast it whole you can blanch it you can got uh, buy bags of diced butternut squash frozen 
in the freezer section at Heinen's or um, wherever you might find your groceries at and throw that in a bowl in the microwave with no water and just nuke it till it's soft and it's a really easy way to start this sauce. So the other way to do it is throw it into your pasta pot. So we're gonna make pasta anyways. So I figured let's do this and make the most out of it, especially because I found this really cool thing in this drawer here. Look at that. You can pull your squash right out of there. Pretty awesome. So I just blanched this until it was soft enough to smush with my fingers. Um, if you don't have chef calluses, don't pick up boiling hot butternut squash. And then I'm going to season this pot really, really heavily. So in the recipe card, it says to season your pot to make it taste like the sea. Uh, I think that's a really valuable orientation point because a lot of people if you tell them like oh yeah you have to salt your pasta water some people will put a tablespoon of salt in there and be like okay I did it and that is by no means what I mean this has almost no salt this will probably blow your mind but don't freak out at least a fistful of salt needs to go into this pot because that water is going to absorb into this pasta but only about a third of it. So that fistful of salt that I put in there is actually only two big pinches that are gonna find its way into these noodles. A little more. So I just keep going back until it's like, okay, does this taste like the ocean? Does this taste like my memory of the sea? And then we know we're in a pretty good place to start our blanching. When you're seasoning food, really important, it has to happen in layers, right? You can't just, cook all this food, make this beautiful sauce, and then at the end, like, oh, I gotta throw some salt in there. Now you just have all of these flavors with salt on top of it. What we want is salt layered in throughout all of the components of this food. All right, so I keep tasting this, tasting it, tasting it. Don't worry, you're not gonna get my cold. Um, because this is boiling water, so it's obviously already sanitizing things. Um, but it's important to keep checking in with that. So tasting as we cook is a part of the like forever process of cooking. It's not something that happens in the beginning, middle, and end. It's constant throughout the entire journey. And uh, it's really difficult sometimes to, to communicate that to folks um, who are used to what I'm working with a lot is kids that are used to working with a lot of prepared foods, right? So if there's one thing we're trying to change more than anything, it's to start identifying ingredients as food, not fully composed things as food. Potato chips, for example. Potato chips start as a potato, right? A hamburger starts as about 30 things before it becomes a hamburger. But when we get into this habit of constantly just going to convenience outlets and then gaining that, it's like, oh, what do you, what's your favorite food? Hamburgers, what's in it? Well, there's a patty, cheese, and a bun. Well, there's a lot of things in that. You know, it actually starts as wheat and dairy and all these other things. So I just think that's a really important lesson to kind of drive home to folks. All right, so we are gonna do a little mix and match here. I'm gonna get some of this butternut squash pureed up with some cheese while the squash is hot, right? You saw me just pull this out of that blanche pot. So I'm keeping this moving while I've got some inherent heat there. And this is not gonna be a glamorous process by any means. Uh, but I, gotta, I have to get the cheese a little bit melted while I have that inherent heat. I'm gonna use the heat of the pasta at the end to dress with sauce. But for this, I have to use this now. All right, pardon my noises. Okay, so this is the science of cooking, people. So what I'm really doing here is I'm tempering this cheese. You guys have heard of tempered chocolate, right? It's basically when you're heating something that has um, fat and solids and a little bit of moisture in it, but you don't want those things to come apart, I'm trying to keep them together. So it's a gentle process. And that's what we're doing here. All right, now we're good. Okay, so I've got my cheese melted in here a little bit. 
I'm gonna add some black pepper to this. Not a ton, so we don't get too spicy. We're gonna add some fresh thyme to this. And then we're gonna add just a pinch, oh, I need a spoon, of this pasta water. Now, you didn't see me add any salt to this because I'm sort of adding salt with our pasta water, which is a key ingredient to a lot of sauces in a, in a kitchen. You can see the change in color, right? I had this beautiful bright orange squash. This is another benefit to using local produce. I have a relationship with this farmer so I can communicate when things are on and when things are off spec. That's another beautiful thing about using the frozen product. Not bad from the hip. When you're using frozen products, they're oftentimes harvested at peak ripeness. And that's when they're processed, flash frozen, right away. So a lot of people will give like, turn their nose up at frozen food. Frozen food is actually some of the best and most nutrient dense food. It's, it's the fastest, quickest process and it traps most of the nutrition in place at one time. So it's a heck of a lot better than buying, say, you know, a squash and letting it sit on your counter for two and a half weeks and then finally getting around to it and cutting the rotten part off. If you would have just bought a frozen bag of squash, you're probably getting a more nutrient dense product in the first place and it's easier to do, right? So let's face it, if cooking isn't easy or fun, what is it? It's work, right? And if you work all day and then come home and have three kids to feed or whatever, man, the last thing you need is a whole nother chore list in front of you. So I really try to convince people like, don't make it so complicated. So if we can make this doable and more easy, we're more likely to replicate it, you know? That's the simple part of it. All right, our pasta's rolling pretty good here. Probably got another 10 minutes. I don't have a full rolling boil. I feel like I did in the beginning, but because I had that squash in there and this thing, so let's talk about power for a second. Let's talk about calories and energy. This is actually a good segue. Calories are just a measure of energy, right? This thing is trans transmitting energy into this pot of water. It's absorbing energy and then I'm throwing noodles in there, right? And it has to absorb that stuff. Well, this is a very dense piece of metal, sort of. I pulled that out of there with all that squash. Out comes all this heat, right? Now there's a little bit of a vacancy of heat in there. I start doing this, and then I throw in room temperature pasta, so that brings the temperature down significantly. This is a big part of what, like, grilling, sauteing, crowding the pan. So we think about this, we talk about this a lot with, with the kids we work with, is like, Thinking about food through the lens of science and physics, this is why cooking is STEM activity, right? Science, technology, engineering, and math. This is what we're doing. We're, we're solving problems in real time. So when we think about that, we can give kids an idea of like, how much pasta do you think you could cook in this pot? And they're like, oh, I don't know, five pounds? Like, come on, man, this thing doesn't even weigh five pounds. How's that even possible? You know what I mean? Really start to think about what is possible with this. Another way of thinking about that, we talk about when we're getting a good sear on a piece of protein, for example. You cannot do that. I got a saute pan here. Oh, I had a saute pan here. There is one. Wait for it, wait for it. I swear by the fifth demo, they're gonna have this thing figured out. It's gonna be great TV. Um, so. You got a saute pan here, right? I got some butter. Pretend this butter is a piece of fish. Boom, I have a piece of fish in the middle of this pan. All of this pan is 400 and 500 degrees. Now I have this one piece of fish in the middle of it that's sizzling in fat. I'm gonna get a beautiful crust on that. As soon as I have three pieces of fish in there, how beautiful is that crust? Significantly less, right? You've diluted the heat transfer of energy Basically, 30% in each direction. So now this is 40 degrees, and this is 40 degrees, and this is 40 degrees. Now this pan is like fighting to be 280 degrees instead of 450 degrees to really create that, right? 
Because when that fish is searing or chicken breast or whatever it is in this pan, it's actually sort of hovering on a layer of steam and fat that's like not super in contact with that pan. So when people are like, man, it always sticks to the grill, it's no longer hovering, dude. It is now, whoop, there's no more steam, there's no more heat energy transfer. Now it's just lazily sitting there on that surface, fighting to get back up to temperature. And what does that do? It actually welds that protein to that pan. And now it's like tearing chicken off of the grill. I know we've all seen this at Memorial Day cookouts and whatnot. That's a real thing of just people do not approach people in that situation have not approached cooking from a scientific perspective yet. And that's, for me, that's the most fun of this job is like really engineering solutions to problems. It's not just flavor. Flavor is easy, in my opinion. Fundamental cooking techniques, that's the part where you really got to drill down into it. One more segue while I wait for these noodles because clearly they are not done yet. Oh, but we're getting close. Okay, great question. We're bringing this down a little bit more regional. So we're using Adams, Reger Adams Reserve Cheddar right here from Great Lakes Cheese. We use a White American from Great Lakes Cheese because we need that emulsification property to keep the sauce together. And then a little bit of Gruyere, and that's where we get that funk, right? We need that funkiness because that's what kind of rounds out the mac and cheese. And I have killed enough time, the pasta is ready. All right. All right, so pasta's ready. I got a little bit of bounce to it, right? A lot of times when people are cooking spaghetti, they're like, oh, throw it to the wall, see if it sticks. Yes, that is a true technique. But what I really look for, especially with this rotini, is does it have bounce? And it does. So then we taste it with a tooth. And it should break a little nicely, but have a little bit of bounce to it as well. And we're in there. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to reserve the heat of this pot. So we're going to strain this pasta off, and then we're going to use this heat. We're going to scoop a bunch of this sauce out of here, which is still warm. And I brought some, I brought some uh, backup sauce over here. And then we're going to stir this all together and then portion it up, and I'll do some cups. So this is, these are gluten-full noodles, and we have some breadcrumbs here with a little bit of toasted um, dried herbs and whatnot and brown butter in here, which kind of really makes it happen for you. So I apologize in advance. All right. Let's do this. Oh, well, she's yelling at me. Okay. So if you do not have a Vita Prep at home, this can be done in a food processor just as easily. You really don't need a ton of that buzzing action. What you really need more than anything is consistency. So you've got to get it to a, a fairly thick paste in the blender or in your food processor because once again as soon as you heat that up again even more right going over these hot noodles your viscosity changes significantly and we need this to cling to our pasta okay all right and we'll grab a little bit of our backup sauce here All right, one of the big reasons that I did this recipe, number one, it's very simple to recreate. Number two, when we do this for kids, I'm getting almost a full portion of vegetables in each portion of pasta. So one of the biggest issues that we're dealing with with kids with like early onset diabetes, fatty liver disease, hypertension in teen years is because the majority of the diet is fat, sugar, and salt. Okay, that's called the bliss point. Food manufacturers know about this. They know it's very highly addictive. So if you have, let's just call it Pop-Tarts and a soda for breakfast or a high C or something like that, by 1030, you are an unbearable animal because you are on the glucose coaster. Now you're crashing, your blood sugar is going down. So I firmly believe that there are people in jail right now because they had a bad breakfast. So imagine being from a marginalized community. Imagine getting pulled over when you're late to work and you had a bad breakfast and now you start going off about it, right? I know that that has happened because I've seen it in high school kids. I've seen it in junior high kids where you just got to pull them aside. It's like, dude, what's going on, man? Ah, blah, 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 this, that, this, you don't understand. Okay, okay. 
what did we have for breakfast this morning? And then you start to unravel it, right? Now we can peel the onion together and really have a constructive conversation. That conversation is not always welcome when we don't feel like we belong. So that's our really our biggest first opportunity with Spice Field Kitchen is create a sense of belonging, make it an environment that it's cool and fun to learn. Throw ourselves under the bus a little bit, you know? And nobody likes to be told what to do, but everyone likes to be asked, what would you love to do? You know what I mean? And then all of a sudden we can start building that bridge with people. All right, I'm gonna start portioning this up here. And we're gonna to top it off with a little bit of these toasted breadcrumbs with fresh herbs. It's kind of the, uh, the secret sauce there. How did we make them? Um, we take uh, panko breadcrumbs, toast them in the oven at about 325 degrees um, until you get a little golden brown edge to them and then take them and toss them with fresh thyme and chopped up parsley and let that moisture kind of come off of them while they're hot. And that's about it. A little bit of onion powder. Mm, there you go. What's the deal with panko? Man, all I can tell you is it's a, it's a larger size breadcrumb. It's a Japanese product. I don't know how it's made, um, but I do know that it stays crispier on, on battered things, on breaded things, than regular traditional breadcrumbs out of a can. Uh, three questions, super simple. A pound of butternut squash is about this much. The batch that I made in this blender was about the size of the recipe batch. If you bought a uh, bag of diced frozen butternut squash, it is a pound, almost always, it's 16 ounces. So that's a pound. Why would you use unsalted butter instead of salted butter? Yes, I threw a ton of salt in here, but then I was adding a little bit of salted pasta water into my sauce to get it to move in the blender. I can't pull salt out of this, right? So if I threw this butter into there, it's in there. And the salinity of butter, the saltiness of butter, is way more intense, right? They're using a very high sodium salt than this kosher salt, right? This kosher salt, sodium chloride, even the difference of salinity of this is diamond crystal salt versus Morton's kosher salt, totally different salts. You taste them next to each other, like, wow, that one's salty and this one's less salty. So we always use unsalted butter because we can always add salt, but we can never remove it. So that's why. And dried sage or fresh sage, yes, you can use the stuff in the jar, but you won't get that personal satisfaction of walking out into your herb garden that you're gonna plant in the spring and clipping your own sage, right? And that is another thing. Man, if you wanna get better at cooking, plant an herb garden as close to your kitchen door as possible. The closer to your kitchen door, the more frequently you'll use it. You'll find yourself putting your raincoat on and going out and grabbing a little bit of time. And just that activity of the connection to the earth is like, that's the sacred part of cooking. Yeah, thank you all. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you all. You're welcome.